In Jesus' name, everybody say Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. Don't sit down yet, I promise you're going to sit down in a minute. I know, I know, but you wore those shoes. You did it. <laughs> Got to bring your comfortable shoes to social. Uh, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter number 12. This is our verse for the year that has our word for the year and now our song for the year. We just Let's read it. Let's read it as one big family today. You're going to have it memorized by the end of 2024, but let's read it together. You ready? Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship. Deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house torching all that needs to burn and he won't quit until it's all cleansed god himself is fire y'all getting good you're getting gooder and gooder every week y'all even do it the himself that's how you say it god himself is fire so uh do, do you notice what it says though do do you see what we've got in the shakeable kingdom and do you see how how what? Thankful. We must be. And not only Thankful. that word right there kept shouting at me all week. And it took me to our text for today, which is found in the gospel according to Luke, chapter number 17. Let's look at this. This is the only story that Luke records, not Mark, not Matthew, not John. Luke is the only one to record this story, this miracle. And it says... Now on his way that he is Jesus to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten? Now, you know when Jesus is asking questions, he don't need information. <laughs> were not all ten cleansed? Where in the world are the other nine? Has no one returned to praise, to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. That, some good stuff. Only one return to give thanks. It's almost like the rest of them hmm, gave me the title for my sermon. I wanna preach you today for about 48 minutes <laughs> from this thought, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best, and just say, neighbor, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor, the one you ignored. Come on, say other neighbor. You're my second option. <laughs> I just want to say thanks, but no thanks. Before you sit down, can we welcome all of our brothers and sisters that are watching this on Pando, all of our social global family. Come on, don't stop clapping. Our Echo location that's going to be launching on Super Bowl Sunday. Shout out Echo. Father, speak today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thanks, but no thanks. Not too long ago, myself and PT went to a restaurant to eat, and we did what we always do. We went to the hostess and said, uh, Madhu, party of five. And the hostess, she was so kind. She said, oh, oh my goodness. 
She said, your family is so, so beautiful. She said, your kids are so cute. And then she gave the suggestion, oh, y'all should have one more. <laughs> to which I immediately said, thanks. <laughs> but no, thanks. <laughs> I, I am good. I am good with the contribution that we have made to the human population. Uh, we have three kids, three kids, as you've often heard me say, three little humans who I love with every fiber of my being. My oldest daughter, Evie, is nine years old. My youngest daughter, Remington, call her Remy Ma, she is six years old. And then right in the middle, my man, child, my namesake, Robert Madu III, who turned eight years old yesterday. That's my boy. And so yesterday was awesome. We had a great family day. We did whatever he wanted to do. We went to the movies. I got him every single Lego that he wanted. Okay, so that was, he's in a Lego season. So we got all his Legos. But as I was presenting all the Legos to him, whew, I kind of paused. I said, oh Lord, am I doing it again? You're wondering what it again is. I had a flashback of a different season in our life. You have to know that before we planted this church, I had an itinerant ministry. I traveled for 16 years to different churches around the world, preaching the gospel before we ever planted this church for 16 years, living out of a suitcase, traveling and preaching. And it was, it was great when I was single. It was great when we first got married to travel together. But whoo, when we had our firstborn daughter, things changed. When I had to leave my wife and my baby girl for the first time to go preach, y'all, I was an emotional mess. And so as she got older, I said, you know what? I don't want her toddler brain to cognitively associate daddy leaving as a bad thing. So I came up with a plan. I said, every time I leave, I'm going to come back with a gift. Just a little gift so she'll know daddy got you. I still kind of bless them and spoil the girls especially because I don't want no dude in the future giving her some gift and her being shocked by anything. Anyway, I digress. And so I always came back. I always came back with a gift. It was the joy of my life, y'all. I would preach. I would come in the door. The best feeling as a dad to walk in your house and just to hear the excitement. Daddy, daddy. And she would come up to me, walk up, give me a big kiss and a big hug. And I'd say, hold on, let me get you a surprise. I would go to my bag, give her her surprise. This happened for several weeks. It was amazing. It was beautiful until one day. It was a dark day. I will never forget this day. Matter of fact, it was raining this day. I came home in my usual fashion. I walked in. I could not wait to hear the hooray from my baby girl. Daddy is home. And this little girl walked right past me. I said, what? Went straight to my bag. <laughs> opened the zipper and started rummaging through the bag. Have you ever been so shocked that you just stop and stare? <laughs> at what you're looking at, and I stopped and I just was staring at her and after she rummaged and pillaged, I would say, through my bag for the longest, she finally looked up and I'm not kidding, with the vocal intonation of frustration, said, Dada, where my surprise? To which I was like, oh, I got your surprise. Y'all, my little daddy heart was crushed and broken that day and here's why it was broken. It wasn't just because she went to go look for the gift or the surprise. I'm the one that bought it. I wanted to give it to her. I was hurt by how quick she was rushing past the giver to get the gift. Furthermore, I wondered to what degree was I culpable and responsible because it was my consistent gift giving that produced within her a sense of entitlement. You have to be careful when you get constants in your life. Because how many of you know it is the human proclivity and propensity to take constants for granted? Often the casualty of consistency is to take the things that are consistent for granted and to think that you are entitled to it. That's why many of us don't even stop to praise God for the sun coming up. You know why? Because you just see it every single day. But let us wake up one day and it's just dark. I bet you start trying to give God some praise and say, God, what is up? It's something about consistency and the things that are constant that we have the tendency to take for granted and even worse, we have a sense of entitlement to it. 
Uh, Dr. Robert Lupton wrote a book called Toxic Charity. And in that book, he actually postulates the dangers of charity and he outlines it in different stages. He says, if you give somebody something once, you will elicit appreciation. He said, if you give somebody something twice, you will then get anticipation. If you give somebody something three times, you will then create expectation. But if you give somebody something four times, you will create a sense of entitlement. They will think they deserve it. Ooh, let me not get too far ahead of myself today. Because I want to let you know that today's message, hear me clearly, is about the need to cultivate the discipline of thanksgiving. The discipline of being thankful. I know it's not November, but just indulge me. I want to talk about being thankful today, being thankful. And, and to be honest, ooh, you might not shout amen today. You might not shout today because I didn't shout when I was writing this message. And I always preach to myself before I preach to y'all. I was repenting when I wrote this message today. So you might not shout today, but that's cool because I don't want you to shout this year. I want you to be unshakable this year. And hear me today. You cannot be unshakable if you are not thankful. You cannot live a life that is unshakable if you do not cultivate the discipline of being thankful. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how? Hello? How? Thankful. thankful we must be. The writer of Hebrews is connecting unshakable to being thankful. You cannot be unshakable unless you are thankful. Elbow your neighbor and say, I know this for you. I know this for you. <laughs> how, how do we cultivate a life of being thankful? Before I even talk about being thankful and before I even start pontificating on how you need to have an attitude of gratitude and before I even tell you today that there are over 400 scriptures in your Bible about thanksgiving and gratitude. Before I even tell you that the insidious inception of sin in the Garden of Eden was with ingratitude when the enemy got them to focus not on all the trees that they did have, but he honed in their attention on the one tree that they did didn't have be before I even give you all of the scientific things that substantiate how good gratitude is to every single facet of your life before I tell you that the Apostle Paul warns us not just in Romans chapter 1 but also in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 that one of the signs one of the blues clues if you will of the last days will be a culture of unthankfulness will be a culture of ingratitude before I tell you today that gratitude improves your brain and your physical health that gratitude helps you sleep better at night that gratitude is the antidote to every toxic emotion before I tell you that gratitude improves every relationship because your heart will naturally gravitate to those that appreciate you before I tell you that gratitude is the evidence of maturity before I tell you that gratitude is what pleases God and ushers you into his presence and brings blessing and favor on your life before I tell you that it is not joy that makes you grateful, it's gratitude that makes you joyful. Before I tell you any of that, I first have to talk about the word I mentioned earlier, which is entitlement. In, there it is, <laughs> title. Man, do you see how big it is on the screen? Yes, Taking up every inch, that's what entitlement does. It takes up every space. It, it thinks it's owed that entire screen. You have to talk about entitlement when you talk about ingratitude because the two are intrinsically connected. You cannot talk about being thankful and not talk about entitlement because you will never be thankful for what you feel entitled to. You will never show gratitude for the things that you think you deserve. And can I tell you, there are a lot of spirits that are operating in the world today, but can I just let you know, there is one that is so big in our culture today. It is the spirit of entitlement. It is that cancerous thing that destroys your soul where you think everybody owes you something. It is the spirit of entitlement. Ladies and gentlemen, if God's love language is gratitude, the enemy's love language is entitlement. 
That's why you have to be careful when God blesses you. Anybody blessed in here? Can I see your hand if you're blessed? You're blessed, all right. You lifted up your hand, you did it. You gotta be careful when the blessing of God is on your life, when God favors you or gives you a title or gives you position or gives you influence or affluence because one of the dangers of receiving the blessing of God, if that blessing is not received with humility and with a discipline of gratitude, the blessing will produce within you a sense of entitlement. It was Martin Luther who said that the greater God's blessings are given, the less they are regarded. It was G.K. Chesterton that said, there are two types of people, those who take things for granted and those who take things with gratitude. This is the danger that all of us can fall prey to. That's why in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when God begins to speak to Moses and let the children of Israel know, you're going to walk into blessing and favor and houses that you did not build and vineyards that you did not plant. And they started getting excited. And with all of that blessing that was coming, he says, but, 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 but be careful that in that you do not forget the Lord your God. Don't start thinking that it was you that did it, that it was your ingenuity, that it was your talent, that it was your hand that brought about the blessing. And that's what entitlement does. Entitlement kills gratitude. Entitlement is different from hope or expectation or believing the promises of God. Entitlement is a focused form of pride that can only see what you think you're owed. Hope says, I expect it. Entitlement says, I deserve it. Can I ask you something? Can I get in your business? I'm going to do it anyway. What do you think you deserve? What do you think you deserve? That is an important question. Because connected to that question, well, let me know whether you have gratitude or whether you have entitlement. What do you think you deserve? Is it a title? Is it a position? It's so funny, church trips me out. People, you, you'll see their entitlement with the things that they say. I've been coming to this church since it started. They still ain't giving me a microphone to sing. Oh, is that what you think you deserve? It's funny, oh, well, I'm gonna get in trouble with this message. <laughs> because I don't know how to not be real. I, I mean, somebody had wanted me to do, wanted, to do, wanted me to do their wedding, and I, I would have been happy to do it, but the dates didn't work out. That's, that's when you planned it, and I know you think that everything revolves around you, but, but I, I couldn't do it, and so I, I, I declined, and I got this, this, this colorful email <laughs> back because I couldn't do the wedding, and in the email, there were words I, I, I still can't forget them. They say, I am a tithing member of this church. And you can't do my wedding. I'm a tithing member. I was like, oh, that's what you think you deserve. I missed that scripture that said, bring your tithe into the whole storehouse because the pastor, irrespective of the schedule, has to do your. Ain't nobody going to say amen. That's all right. In tithe, what do you think you Deserve. What do you think is owed to you? That is an important question because your sense of gratitude or your sense of entitlement hinges on your answer to that question. My, my friend, Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr., who has an amazing church in Miami, I never forget the first time I visited their offices, he had something in his office. Oh, if I was a copier, I would take it and put it in my office. But right in his office, I saw above the door on the way out, he had this beautiful statement. It said this right here. It says, nobody owes me anything. Jesus gave me everything. I said, yo, if I was a biter, I would put that in my office too. What a beautiful reminder to walk out of your office every day and to go, nobody owes me anything because Jesus gave me everything. And when you have a sense of entitlement, you walk around and think that just because you showed up, somebody is supposed to give you something. But I'm telling you, if you want the blessing and the favor of God on your life, if you really want to be unshakable, you want to live with that attitude. Nobody owes me anything because Jesus gave me 
everything. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why entitled people always lose, but a thankful person can't lose. Because when you're entitled, you think you deserve so much, so you are perpetually disappointed because you think people owe you something. But when you are thankful, there is no situation you can be in and not win because you're just looking for ways to be thankful. If you lose your job, you say, oh, I really didn't want to be here anyway. Maybe God has the job I've been dreaming of. Or maybe I'm supposed to start the business. When somebody walks away, you say, thank God they left. That must not have been God's will for my life. You must have my husband. You must have my real wife in the future. When the lights get turned off, you know what? I got some bath and body candles. I was waiting to light. I got to thank God in every situation. I wish I could see the thankful people that are in here. If you're entitled, you ain't got to say nothing. But if you're one of those ride or die, I can't lose. Thankful people, I dare to take like 15 seconds and give God the best praise that you got. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. You don't have to wake me up this morning, but you did. I'm thankful. I get to preach the gospel. I'm thankful. People didn't have to show up today. I'm thankful. I walked in here. I'm thankful. My heart is still beating in my chest. I'm thankful. We got to destroy this spirit of entitlement. It is a shame when you are louder about your complaints than you are about your praise. It's a shame when everybody in your office has to hear you. Oh, I can't believe this. But they've never heard you open up your mouth and glorify God. Not what? Complaining on the job when some people are in an employment line. That's why I love 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. This verse right here, this is going to bless your life. It, it, it would spend, I would spend all of my life just trying to live out this verse right here. If this was the only scripture you did this year, if this was the only scripture you did this year, your life would be better. Look at what Paul says. Rejoice. Always. Wait a minute. Rejoice. When? Oh, that's some powerful stuff right there. That means no matter what I'm going through, joy is always in my reach. Joy is a choice. It is a decision. If you don't believe me, you better come with me this week like we did and went into a hospital room with Jessica and baby Isabella Joy, who God is going to heal and cause to wake up out of that coma. But I watched Jessica, who had expectant faith, but she still was smiling in the room. She still had this peace and this joy in spite of going through the battle of her life joy is always within my reach that's what the Bible teaches us rejoice always pray when when continually uh oh here it goes give thanks in in not for in because that messed some of y'all up earlier how I'm supposed to praise God if my lights get turned out how am I supposed to praise God when I lost it? No, I'm, I'm not praising him for it. I got to thank him yeah. in it. Oh, see, that's how you know you're immature in your faith if you only thank God for getting something. But if you ever mess around and start thanking God in the prison, in the dungeon, watch how all of a sudden chains start breaking and all of a sudden God's manifest presence will step in the room like it did with Paul and Silas because they developed the maturity to say, I don't just praise God for what he does. I thank and praise God in every circumstance. I'm, I'm not thankful for the bad things that happen, but I'm thankful in it because there's something in it he must be doing. And this is the part going to jack you up. This is the part. How come didn't nobody tell me this verse earlier in my life? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All them prayers you've been praying, talking about, I really need to know the will of God. I just know, I don't know. I just, I need his will for my life. Will you just touch and agree that I know his will? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. That is his will. I want to know. Do you have a prayer list, but you don't got a thankful list? Oh, 
are you louder in your complaints to God than you are at the front worshiping God? <laughs> what do we hear more? If, 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 if you're louder in your complaints than you are in your praise and your thanks, you might have entitlement. See, this is the part in the message where everybody goes, oh, I know who this is for. Girl, let me text my coworker. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, my direct report, that sense of entitlement, I'm going to send them the link to this message. But, but before you text them, which is cool, like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> Can you do the most healthy thing and check yourself first? If you want to know an area in your life where you have entitlement, listen to what you complain about. Your complaints will tell you where you have a sense of entitlement. Your complaints, complain. Don't you hate a complainer? Somebody like, I don't know if I wanna say that cause I complain <laughs> and I love me. <laughs> One scientific study says that the average human complains 15 to 30 times a day. Verbal expression of frustration Complain. You know what I think complaining is like? Bad breath. It just, it, it just. Come on, you ever woke up and you're just having a good day and hear somebody complain, you're like, oh my God. Oh, really? Nothing's going good? No, my right toe. I just saw another wart on it. Really? Yeah, I checked WebMD. I think I'm gonna die next week. Really? Just blah. See, I'm, I'm going to bless y'all. I'm going to bless y'all because, oh, if y'all steal my stuff, don't steal my stuff. Because y'all family, I give you my ideas. To me, complaining is like bad breath. If you want to check where you have a sense of entitlement, listen to what you complain about. And to me, complaining is like bad breath. So I have a solution that I am releasing for the first time here at Social Dallas. You will not find this at Trader Joe's. You will not find this anywhere else. And if you steal my stuff, I'm telling you, I'm going to come after you, okay? This is for you when you complain, because how many know sometimes you don't know when you have breath, bad breath, till a good friend tells you, no, I'll take it, take the gum, take the mint. <laughs> and if you got other people around you complaining too, this gonna bless you, you ready? Give a good close up, cameraman. I got some. Don't steal it, if y'all steal my stuff. Some entitlements. This is gonna help you whenever you start complaining. Whenever you start complaining, or somebody around you complains, just get you a little entitlement. L let me give you an example of how it works, right? You in your car driving, oh, there's traffic. You complain about traffic, you think you deserve to have a car. You know who doesn't complain about traffic? People that are walking. This message is good, my God. Entitlement. Next time you in line at your local coffee shop and your barista has the nerve to mess up your order. I mean, my goodness, you were so clear. 2% milk, not oat. Next time you want to turn up your, I cannot, uh, this is wrong. Uh, uh, uh. Ain't wrong, you are. Entitlement. 2.2 billion people in the world don't have access to clean water? You, you mad because your milk was wrong? You, you need an entitlement. <laughs> God does not inhabit the complaints of his people. He inhabits thanksgiving. Enter into his. The, before you even get to the door. The gate is thanksgiving. The gate of access to his presence. I wonder why I don't feel his presence. Are you giving thanks? No wonder he's so distant. You complain more than you praise. Is this helping anybody today? Oh, that was my intro. 
<laughs> brings me to my text today. I am intrigued with Luke 17 for many reasons. First of all, this story that we read is only found in the Gospel of Luke. Dr. Luke, who will give us not only the book of Luke, but also gives us Acts, feels the need to talk about this unique healing that Jesus does with 10 lepers. It is not only unique to me because Luke is the only one that writes about it. It's unique to me because Jesus is doing a group miracle. Since when does Jesus do miracles to connect groups? <laughs> now you understand that when you study the Gospels, most of the people that got a miracle, it was some individual that was desperate. A woman with the issue of blood who pressed her way to the crowd. A man with a withered hand. Even in Luke chapter 5, there is a leper, but he is one and he comes to Jesus. But this one trips me out because this is a group miracle. Somebody say group. A group of not one, not five, not eight, ten men get the same miracle. Ten men. I wish I could make the Bible come to life. I wish I had like nine dudes who are waiting side stage to come on stage so we can make the Bible come to life for the ADD people who are about to fall asleep. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Come on. You see that walk? I didn't, did somebody tell y'all to do that? I love that. Look at that. Look at it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Could, could y'all come closer? Like, let's get in a group. Like, come over here. Yeah, come come over here, Darren. Yeah, just come around me. Yeah, let's, let's act like we love each other. Come on. <laughs> Since when does Jesus do a miracle for a whole connect group? Now, here's what intrigues me about this group of 10 men. They are all lepers. They're all lepers. If you study your Bible, you will know that leprosy was one of the most debilitating and deadly diseases that you could ever have. People didn't even know how they would get it, but they would pick it up and it was highly contagious and it would start as a spot on your skin and it would spread over your entire body. To get leprosy would be a death sentence. It had all kinds of ramifications to your body. First of all, the bacteria would begin to form in your body and it would make your nerve cells dead to where you would lose feeling in your body. Somebody could be cutting your arm and you wouldn't even feel it. There are stories of lepers who would be asleep and rats would be gnawing on the open wounds on their body while they were sleeping and they wouldn't even know it. Slowly you would die. All of a sudden, you would lose limbs and lose body parts. The moment you got it, anybody that came close to you, you would have to yell, unclean, unclean, and let them know, don't come close to me. Because of the disease that I have, it was isolation. The moment you got it, you were stripped from your family, you were stripped from your kids, you were stripped from every single person that you love, and you had to live in isolation. And isn't it crazy? That here we have a group of men, different hues of skin, but all have the same disease. Different heights, but all with the same issue. Different, as we will find later, cultural background. Some Jews, one a Samaritan, and yet they're all coming together with the same issue of leprosy. This is why leprosy is a metaphor for sin. Because sin is a disease that will affect you no matter who you are, no matter what color of skin you got, no matter how much money you got in the bank. And they're all connected. But this is what, this is why I had to call y'all up here because this is what messed me up. Luke is letting us know something about this group of lepers that are together. Because typically when you got leprosy, you had to go in isolation you had to get away from community 
But the fact that Luke lets us know that Jesus is traveling on the border in between Galilee and Samaria and 10 lepers are together is letting us know that even leprosy needed community. This is why our church is social, Dallas. Because you cannot deny that no matter who you are, you need a community. You need people to connect with. You are a social being. You were created for community and connection. But ooh, you gotta watch out what you connect around. Because this connection right here is a connection on disease. It's a connection on sickness. Have you noticed how people always connect sometimes around the wrong things? Have you ever noticed how the offended people have a way of migrating to other offended people and they talk about Have you ever noticed how the liars will connect with other liars and they'll have a lion connect group? Have you noticed how people will... I knew I wasn't going to get no amens. I knew going into it. So I, I, I want to pause right now and ask somebody, since we are social beings and you always have a connect group, what, what is your point of connection? What, what do you connect on? I remember talking to somebody at social that said, it's crazy, I, I, my friends, all they want to do is go to the club and, and I, I struggle with alcoholism, all they want to do is drink. And I told them, hey, let's hang out. But, but I just don't want to go to the club and I just, just don't want to drink. And she was saying, it's, it's, it's a struggle to find people to hang out with. And I didn't realize that our connection point was the drinking and the clubbing. So I just want to ask you, what do you connect around with your connect group? Because you have a connect group and you were connecting around something. Their connection point was leprosy. It was sickness. But somebody in the group, I don't know who, maybe it was you, maybe it was you, maybe it was you. Somebody in the group said, I heard about this man named Jesus. I heard that he is healing every sickness. I heard that he is healing every disease. And yes, we've been connected on our sickness, but I wonder what would happen if we all connected and said, let's make action towards the presence of Jesus. What would happen if 10 men who were sick said, I know we've connected about our sickness and things are falling off of you and things are falling off of me, but what would happen if as an army of men who are sick, if we decided, let's go after the presence of God. Let's find where he is. I've heard his report and if he can heal them, maybe he can heal us. If he can deliver somebody else, maybe he can deliver me. I want to tell somebody, get you around a group of people People that says no matter what it takes I'm gonna get to the presence of Jesus no matter what I gotta go through help me find where he is that's who you ought to connect with I don't need anybody connecting me to anything else but him so all ten of them can you see him let's move all ten of them said let's go find him where he at maybe this way let's go find him can you see him all ten trying to find where Jesus is, and when they found him, I love what happens. The Bible says they stood at a distance. They stood at a distance, and it says that Jesus saw them. I want to pause right there and thank God that even when I'm sick, and even when I'm struggling, that he sees me. That might not be a big deal to you, but when you have been isolated, when you've only been connected to sick people, I'm thankful for a savior that when everybody else doesn't know what I'm going through and they just see my little plastic smile, thank you, Jesus, that you see me. You see the real me. You know what I'm dealing with on the inside. It says that Jesus saw them and it said from a distance, they shouted out at him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Six words. Jesus, Master, they didn't want to get too close. So they said, let's just stay from a distance, but maybe he can do something. So they all said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Join in anytime. <laughs> Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy. Now see, I messed them up because you see how they're saying it? Jesus, Master, have mercy. The Bible says they said it with a loud voice. 
They were desperate. All my years of studying leprosy, I did not know until I was studying this week that one of the final stages of leprosy would affect your vocal cords. And even lepers towards the end would start to lose their voice. So for them to shout at a savior who was distant, to lift up a loud voice showed their last desperation because they said, I don't know when I'll be able to shout again. This was not a curable disease. You had to have a miracle. So can y'all just show them what desperation sounds like? Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Six words conveying desperation. And you would think Jesus' response, especially if you read Luke chapter 5, would be, hey, how y'all doing? I'll come to you. Miracle, 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 miracle. Now go ahead and tell everybody what I did. That's not what he did. He touched the leper in Luke chapter 5 to let people know, I'm not afraid of any sickness or any disease. I'm changing the game. When I touch the unclean, they become clean. I don't become unclean. I impart to you what I have. Thank God for righteousness that it's not my record. It's not what I do. It is his righteousness that is imputed towards me. But that's not what he did to them. They had a six word cry for desperation. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Oh, I got to get in that mercy. You know you don't have entitlement when you're asking for mercy. They didn't even ask for healing. They asked for mercy. Mercy says, please, 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 please. I know I don't deserve it, but would you have mercy? They didn't have any entitlement in them that says, come on, you healed everybody else. You better heal me. No, 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 no. When you're asking for mercy, you know that all entitlement has left your life. And that's why some people don't get the breakthrough. When you realize that you don't owe, God doesn't owe you anything, but he owes you a hell, but he doesn't give it to you, you will lift up your hands and just say, Lord, have mercy. They asked for mercy. Then he said, who oh, they said, master, master. In the Greek, they were saying that you have ultimate and supreme authority. You're the master, please have mercy. And Jesus gives a six word response to a six word cry for desperation. Jesus, master. Have mercy on us. He goes, all right, you calling me master? Let's put it to the test. Go show yourselves to the priest. Woo! What? <laughs> Go show yourself. What kind of response is that to somebody that said, Jesus, have mercy on us? You only went to the priest when you were healed of leprosy. You only went to the priest when your body was healed and then the priest could examine you and say, now you can go back to society. But you're telling me, go show yourself to the priest. They had to be looking at each other like, did, did y'all hear what I heard? Why he want us? We ain't healed. Then the Bible says something powerful. As they went, they were healed. As they went, they were cleansed. Can we walk some more? In other words, y'all ready? My healing is predicated on my obedience to what he told me to do. I'm not healing you before. I want to know, will you do what I told you to do and go show yourself to the priest? Keep on walking. The reason why some people don't ever get the miracle that they've been wanting is because they never follow the first step of obedience. When God tells you to go do something, you have to go do it. And as they walked, 
I don't know in what part of the walk they were killed, but I know that once they got to that priest, all of that skin started looking brand new because God said, I got a miracle for you, but it's on the other side of your obedience. And if you want to stay stuck and wait for me to do it on your time schedule, you will never get the miracle. But if you just walk by faith and say, I don't even know if this is going to work, but I got to trust him. If he's really my master, I got to do what he told me to do. So I got to keep walking till I find the priest. I don't know what part of the walk they got the healing. I just know when they got to the priest, they got healed. And many of us are stuck wanting God to do the healing before we give the obedience. Wanting God to do the miracle our way and it's nothing but entitlement. If he is your master, you must do it the way he told. Can you see them? They are a living, walking picture of walking by faith. Oh man, I hope he's right. Can you see the people? What are y'all doing here? Please, please don't yell. Hey, you're unclean. You're not supposed to. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, but I got to do what he told me to do. You know if you'll just obey him in spite of what other people are shouting in your ear. If you can trust him, even when you look ridiculous, when it makes no sense. <laughs> By the time they got to the priest, they were cleansed. But the problem with nine of them is the excitement of the healing made them, in my opinion, go back to the families and the life they had been isolated from for years. I truly believe all of them were grateful. They really were. But nine of them allowed the excitement of receiving the miracle and the blessing to make them forget the one that made it possible. Maybe they had good things to go back to. Maybe one said, I gotta see my wife. I have not seen her in years. I remember the day I was taken away. Maybe the other one said, I gotta see my kids. I wanna be the dad that's there for them. All that is good, but only one of them said before I go anywhere else before I go back into society I have got to find Jesus I've got to thank him for bringing restoration to my life only one see anybody can walk to go get the miracle but only one said I gotta go walk to find the one that did the miracle I wonder how long it took him to find Jesus see you know where the priest is at the synagogue but Jesus is a different priest he would be anywhere and everywhere I wonder how how long he was looking and looking and asking people have you seen Jesus why are you looking for him because I gotta find the one that made me whole I gotta find the one that healed me I gotta find the one that made me new again I won't stop until I find him you want to know what worship it looks like you want to know what devotion looks like when well, you say whatever it takes for me to find Jesus I will do it I will search I won't let people make me walk away from God because you hurt me in church I love him too much. I got to find. I was thinking about that this morning, mom. I was wondering how long did it take for him to find him? But when he did, look at what he did. He fell on his knees. And he said, thank you. No, I'm sorry. It says he lifted up with a loud voice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Why did he have to lift it up with a loud voice? Because if I was loud when I wanted the healing, I better be loud when I get the miracle. Oh, I need somebody in this place. If you've been loud complaining, how come you can't be loud when he blesses you? How come you can't be loud when he shows up in your life? He deserves it. He wouldn't stop. He said, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hear me. I'm all for moments of quiet. I'm all for different expressions of praise. But hear me, gratitude that is not expressed is ingratitude. 
If you're thankful something needs to come out of your mouth, say something. Not just to Jesus, say it to the people that you care about. They can't read your mind. If you care about your wife, open up your mouth and tell her. I don't care how long y'all been married. If you love that husband, you ain't gonna complain your way into making him a better man. You ought to start speaking life over him. Open up your mouth and say something. Some of y'all come in church every week tell me I'm just gonna worship like this maybe your breakthrough is on the other side of you opening up your mouth and verbally expressing what it means this ain't about style this is what gratitude is gratitude unexpressed reads as ingratitude to the recipient but you gotta say something there he is worshiping and look at what Jesus says to him verses 17 18 and 19 Jesus as he's worshiping in that beautiful passage in Luke yeah when one of them when he saw he was healed came back praising God in a loud voice threw himself at Jesus feet and thanked him oh Thanks, Dr. Luke, for being thorough. He was a Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jew. It's one thing to be a leper. It's another thing to be a Samaritan leper trying to get healing from a Jewish rabbi. This man had double the reason to know, I don't deserve it. But maybe that's why he's the one that came back. Maybe the other ones were like, yeah, I appreciate you, Jesus, but come on, we of the house of Israel. You're supposed to do it for us. Entitlement. But the one who was fully aware, I don't deserve it, is the one who came back. And look at what Jesus says. Next verse. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? You mean to tell me the other nine took the miracle and just said thanks, but no thanks. You're not worth walking back to to find to say thank you. But look at what Jesus says to the one. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. I thought I am well. I'm healed. Oh. That word well, also whole in other translations, also the Greek word sozo, where we get saved. Your faith has saved you. It is possible to experience an outward miracle of blessing and miss the point of salvation. All 10 got healed externally, but only one got a healing that will last not just in this lifetime, but for eternity. Only one was saved in his soul. I wonder how many people today just want God to fix the external. What good is a good marriage if your soul is not saved? What good is a new car if your soul is not saved? What good is it if you get the raise and the money and you lose your soul? Only one got cleansed externally and internally, and it was the one I said, thank you. 
I'm going to ask every head be bowed and eyes be closed and everybody to stand. I humbly present this sermon to you as somebody who is doing the hard work of cultivating a discipline of gratitude. Hear me when I tell you it's not enough to just to have an attitude of gratitude. There must be a discipline. Something that you do daily to remind yourself, I deserve hell, but thank you, Jesus. More than somebody responding to an altar today, this message would be a success is if you started some daily discipline, because it is a discipline of gratitude. We have started one in our house around the table before we touch the food. We'll go around and say what we're grateful for. We do it in staff meeting before we're getting ready to analyze how we can be better as a church and all the different things. We just go around the table. What, what are you grateful for? That's a discipline. For the longest, I would just get up on my drive before I'd work out and I'd just play this song. First thing in the morning, you have been so good to me. God, I can't believe how you love me. What a friend you have been. I have to start my day going, God, thank you for being so good. Thank you that I am loved by you. Don't let my complaining ever be louder than my thankfulness and my praise. I don't know if it's a gratitude journal. I don't know what it is you have to do, but I do know that this will not come natural. There's something you have to do in the behavior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to give an invitation for somebody to receive what the one out of the nine got. His soul was cleansed. Heads about eyes are closed if you're here today and you say, Pastor Robert, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus. Today is your day. Maybe the desperation of him fixing something externally has brought you here and that's fine as long as you come to him. But what you need is deeper than a raise, is deeper than something externally. He died to save your soul. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed today, if you're here and you say, Pastor Robert, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, but today I need to come to him and say, here I am. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I could see it say, today I need to give him my life. Maybe you were walking with God for a season, but you turned away and now he's calling you to do the walk back to come home. If that's you, lift up your hand. Thank you, God. Thank, I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Can we pray this prayer as one big family? We're all going to say it, but especially those of you who responded. Would you say this from your heart? Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for living the life that I was supposed to live for dying the death that I was supposed to die. Lord, I refuse to have a sense of entitlement, to live in this culture of unthankfulness. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my life from this moment forward. I will cultivate the discipline of thanksgiving because you have been so good to me. Lord, thank you that nobody owes me anything because you gave me everything. And for this, I give you my praise, my thanks, and my life. And
Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen.